Well, week seven happened. Not some great football, but, 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 but some good players made some big plays. And once again, just massive sweeping changes across the fantasy football landscape. Today we go team by team, game by game, player by player, and moment by moment to bring you the goodness. John Daigle from ETR. Right now, Ray GQ of this very channel plus Destination Devi. Ray, give me like one word. You're you're a positive, optimistic guy overall. How are you feeling in this moment? <laughs> it's just a cackle. Perfect. You All right, gotta we'll love take it. that. You gotta love it. You just you <laughs> gotta love it. You gotta love it. You also need to love the uh, NFC North. That's where we're going to kick things off because all of these teams, every single one of them are playoff viable and maybe even a few potential Super Bowl contenders. And we'll kick things off with Daigle's game. The Green Bay Packers beating the Houston Texans 24 to 22 on a last second field goal. Jordan Love, since he has returned, Daigle has just launched moonshot after laser beam down the field that is so fun mixed and matched with the coaching stylings of Matt LaFleur. Uh, these guys come from the same tree-esque with this Packers offense and the Texans offense, albeit very different offensive outcomes in this one. Big fight feels from the very beginning of this one as well as Stephon Diggs and Jair Alexander, obviously both who go back to the NFC North when Diggs was with the Vikings, got into a big scuffle pregame both sidelines running over and separating them. And Diggs was asked what was going on after the game. And he said, quote, I'm never the bigger person. I ain't letting shit go, unquote, which is perfect <laughs> and something I'm going to use moving forward. I'm never the bigger person is the best thing I've heard. But the story of the first half of this game was turnovers. Houston scored 16 points off Green Bay's three errors, two being unnecessary interceptions by Jordan Love because – between all the magic that you mentioned, Josh, it's yeah. including the 20 yard pass touchdown into the tightest window possible to Tucker Kraft, just an athletic specimen who comes down with it for the score. There's also a lot of Jordan love as I, I keep comping him to Tony Romo and that he's one of the last few gunslingers alive because it would actually help if Jordan love had a little bit less confidence in himself. He truly believes he can make every throw. And while we've seen some special moments, his two interceptions today just did not need to be thrown at all. And then also the other one in the first half being just an accidental touch by a blocker on special teams that Houston recovered and then immediately pushed down the rest of the field. Josh Jacobs later on retook the lead in a game that featured seven lead changes just back and forth with his first career touchdown catch on his 212th reception. He finally gets there. And Houston responded with one last field goal. So, less than two minutes remaining with the clock on their own 30, Love finds Tucker Craft for eight yards, Dontavian Wicks for 13, and Romeo Dobbs for catches of 12 and six yards to set up Brandon McManus, who, remember, was signed on Wednesday to replace rookie Braden Arbison, who was released because he went 12 of 17 on field goal tries inside of 50 yards. And then McManus is the one to sink the game, winning 45-yard field goal as time expired to move the Packers to 5-2. and two. All right, before we go any further, you know that we have two primetime Monday night football contests. So the best way to enjoy that is to play Pick'em over on Underdog. Look at all that. We can get Derrick Henry. I mean, 81 and a half rushing yards. That's all we need at the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. We get to go down to like Lad McConkey. Hopefully he plays because if he does, I think he can dice up this Arizona Cardinals defense. He's been this close and the Chargers just haven't needed to throw the football at all. But even if he doesn't, I mean, my guy, J.K. Dobbins, 99 and a half rushing plus receiving yards. Let's get it. Let's boogie. The best place and the best way to play pick them is on underdog and it's use promo code the show or click the link in the description down below. Because if you're first time signing up, we'll throw a new special in your direction and we'll match a good portion of your first deposit. Again, support us by supporting Underdog because they allow us to make the show. Go play on Underdog right now. Talk me through this CJ Stroud performance. I, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll table the Packers stuff because it is not a surprise to me to see Jordan Love throw three touchdowns compared to two interceptions. You know, it's not a surprise for me as of this moment Josh Jacobs hovering around the running back 12 to 14 mark. It's not a surprise to me that we get all these receivers from Dobbs down to Christian Watson and not knowing what to expect from them. What is shocking to me is CJ Stroud going 10 of 21 for 86 yards and four sacks. I do not frequently attribute 
defense to the Green Bay Packers moniker and label, but from coverage wise, from a pass rushing standpoint, this has to be one of the best performances of the season from any team. The Packers pass rush was incredible today, but I think it's more about the Texans identity for better or worse when Joe Mixon has played this year. Only the Eagles, who have a rushing quarterback in Jalen Hurts, have a higher run play rate from neutral game script than the Texans this season in the three games that Mixon has played. And that's why Houston is also averaging the second most yards to go on third down because these early down runs have also not been efficient. And thus, C.J. Stroud is asked to bail out Bobby Slowick. And today, whenever you can send the house, not only send the house, but also get there, that is a disaster on third and eight and third and nine, obviously. And that's kind of what happened today. I know even like Tank Dell, who emerged with season highs across the board finally in his first game without Nico Collins last week, an egg, a no-show in the box score. And he did have his chances. In the first quarter, he had two end zone targets. He dropped one of them. The other one was a basically impossible catch. Uh, he jumps up. He tries to toe tap his way in the back of the end zone, but he's so small, the defender just runs and pushes him out of bounds. Like he can't fight to stay in. So the opportunities were there, but yes, it's just the fact that the passing game didn't even have the chance to get it done. And the few opportunities they did have, yes, the Eagle, the Packers made sure they were under duress. Dago, if you had to do it quickly, man, with the, with the Texan side of the ball, confidence meter, Moving forward for, for some of these weapons, like it feels like Joe Mixon is a locked and loaded, no doubt about it. But when you're mm -hmm. talking about Dell, Diggs, without Nico Collins being there, is this just a product of this game script? Or do you still have confidence with Tank Dell, Stefan Diggs moving forward? Another incredible day for Joe Mixon. At least 20 fantasy points in all three starts this year and in every touchback. Rewind to last week when in the first half he outtouched Damian Pierce 12 to 3 and only then did Cam Akers who was traded and Dario Gumbawale get involved. Today Ogumbawale, Damian Pierce combining for three touches behind Mixon's 25 plus. So it's all Joe Mixon. Like you have to be happy with three top five finishes this year. You have to be happy if you have Joe Mixon for as long as he's healthy. Beyond that, it is Tank Dale, who I still have all the confidence in the world in. Again, when you pass for less than 100 yards, no one's going to get there. And then sneakily, because we're always looking for a fringe tight end one just to plug in and cross our fingers, Dalton Schultz, it's not much, I know, but a team high 28 receiving yards today. He's the one who's actually popped in terms of being targeted on his routes the last two weeks with Nico Collins as well. Beyond that, we're just never going to get, in my opinion, the Xavier Hutchins of the world there weekly. I couldn't tell, and it's always a bad sign uh, when Hayden was tweeting out that every single, well, 75% of the Texans opening drives started with a run, 75%. Um, I mean, that's, that's not so stuff. And I understand that in the box score, we can look at 25 carries for 115 yards and two touchdowns. And you even undersold Joe Mixon a little bit. Every single game he started this year, well, the three healthy ones that he started and finished, it's 25 points at least per game. He's the running sure. back two on the season right now, but I'm a huge fan of what Slowick did last year. It was a bunch of under center, deep play action, downfield shots, two man routes, extra protection. But this offensive line, albeit in the first few weeks, it didn't seem like this, has definitely regressed. Whenever I was able to check out this game, there were twists and stunts up front that they just couldn't cover. They couldn't block them up. And then these delayed blitzes. And like once that's put on tape, it's not like this Packers defense is one of the best units in the league. Like yeah. once that's put on tape, then uh, that is something that the better defenses across the league are are going to see and i'm sure you know it was some of the minnesota vikings and what they did against cj stroud in this offense a little bit in the past too is kind of what jeff halfley and the packers defense copied at the same time and if houston was not awarded those short fields due to turnovers it would have looked even worse throughout the game yeah okay on the packers end we knew we we're going to get this quartet quadruple wide receivers with somehow don taven wicks going from week to week to being active in this game. And in fact, even when we weren't counting on Den Dontavian Wicks, it is just fitting that he comes in and gets six targets, three receptions, 48 yards and a touchdown. But once again, and I don't want to get too upset because this Packers offense is so much fun to watch, but like the one bankable piece that we thought we could get, no matter what matchup, no matter who was in the lineup or out of the lineup was Jaden Reed. And here he gives us four targets, two receptions for 10 yards. Is there anything to read into this? 
No, another letdown performance that, remember, Ray watched the Packers last week and said, we just need something a little more progressive, a little more intuitive for how Reed is used rather than still being treated as a slot guy closer to the line of scrimmage. And that's kind of what happened today. Even Dontavian Wick's long 20-yard touchdown was still a deep shot along the sideline that he then ran upfield and dove for the pylon. Um, Had a couple other opportunities downfield that were – both bad throws, bad routes. They were just leftover opportunities, but it's just a whack-a-mole constantly. Today, Dobbs gets there with a team high 30% target share. Wicks, 18.5% of the team's targets, which is actually his lowest mark in a full game this year. But again, Christian Watson was the guy who was a top 36 player last week, and then Wicks was the one coming in with a shoulder injury, and he's the one who gets there over Watson, who instead yeah. only had a carry for nine yards. Uh, with all at full strength, and this is the first time all of them completed a game since week one. Like, how do you play the whack-a-mole? How do you pick and choose weekly? Daigle, I mean, this is back-to-back weeks where Dobbs has been usable. And I noticed it a little bit last week, and not enough to even point out a trend. But I'm watching the flow of the game, and I love the motion with Wicks. But I'm thinking, do something else outside of throw him in motion and try to pop him out. Is this just one of those things where Jordan Love is just so good at just finding the open receiver, hitting whomever's there, that it that it is truly whack-a-mole week to week with these pass catchers? I think so, because personally, when I do matchups that establish the run uh, and sifted through this one, there was nothing that stood out that gave one of the Packers wide receivers an advantage over the others. And Dobbs even could have had a 100-yard day. He had a big drop over the middle of the field. Maybe it was slightly overthrown. It was I, the fourth quarter, I believe. It touched his fingertips, nearly went down for an interception instead. But at least in another game, it's one that Love still targets Dobbs since he returned from his personal suspension. So right now, again, it seems like two will get their weekly as top 36 players. And if Dobbs is always one of those guys because he's just on the field running the most routes, that's okay too. But choosing the others is just really hard at this time. Uh, Texans coming up are, well, they're first in the AFC South still. They have the Colts, then the Jets, then the Lions after that. And as for the Green Bay Packers, it's the Jaguars the Lions, and the Chicago Bears. Uh, and just shout out to Josh Jacobs for getting your first receiving touchdown in your sixth <laughs> season. I mean, that is the one of the more unbelievable stats in football right now, and uh, we never have to repeat it ever again. Okay, I do want to stay in the NFC North because I had a fantastic matchup. Detroit Lions being the Minnesota Vikings, 31-29. Mm-hmm. to 29. And heading into this contest, the entire conversation was, how would this Lions offense fair against Brian Flores' defense that had shut down the NFL's best quarterbacks, it felt like, all season long. And honestly, we saw both answers in the first half. I mean, the Lions opened with a three and out plus a failed fake punt, a three and out, and a three and out. And at this point, they were down 10 nothing after a 30-yard Aaron Jones touchdown run, who looked fully healthy, by the way, going on for 14 carries for 93 yards, again, with this long touchdown run of... 34 to go along with three catches for 23 yards. Um, But then they started clicking. They started picking up the blitzes and the pressure looks that Flores is putting out there. And that gave us a five play 69 yard touchdown drive, a 45 yard touchdown run uh, by Jameer Gibbs, where he cuts up field great block by uh, Tim Patrick on the outside of Springham. He makes a safety whiff in the open field. Boom, long gain. Then a five play, 83 yard touchdown drive. That brings us to 14 to 10 uh, with the Lions lead. Amon Ross St. Brown for 34 yards. Again, Tim Patrick, the ultimate role player after coming over from Sean Payton's Denver Broncos, uh, is used as, as a seventh man uh, pressure look by the Vikings. And he's used as an extra base the offensive tackle to pick up. I believe it was Harrison Smith or someone on the edge double teams him with Dave Montgomery. And then we get a seam pass to Amon Ross St. Brown for that score. And then nine plays, 72 yards, 21 to 10 lead a third and six rushing touchdown for yes, Jameer Gibbs. They ran right into this pressure blitz look and ran right over them. So again, that brings us to halftime 21 to 10 here and out of half punches were traded. Vikings get a 25 yard touchdown to Justin Jefferson, a beautiful slot fade look that gave Justin Jefferson, uh, a leverage advantage based off motion. He beats a Meek Robertson with a Robertson, I should say, with a really nice contested catch grab. Khalif Raymond pops up here again, another ultimate skill player 
a great conversion on third nine and then a touchdown where he made Stephon Gilmore fall to his knees with his release, a nice catch and run there. Uh, then after a field goal, Ivan Pace fumble six after Josh Metellus forces a uh, punch of the football out from David Montgomery. They fail the two pointer. So in the closing seconds, of course, Lions kicker Jake Bates wins it 15 seconds ago. And if the Vikings had succeeded, then we'd be heading to overtime. And instead, again, the Lions win 31 to 29. Could not say more positive things about Jared Goff and how he was able to reset and hit that button after their third drive. One of his best performances against pressure in his entire career. At one point, he was like 18 of 18 after already having a perfect game earlier this year. And he finished 22 of 25, 280 yards, two touchdowns and four sacks taken. Next gen stats charted golf, nine of 11 under pressure today did really well. I was watching this one as well. Cause I was so interested in the matchup and a lot of times too, Flores confused them by instead rushing only two or three and dropping back eight. Um, but even then for golf to continue fighting through and for Ben Johnson to still just keep finding a way to get everyone the ball. The issue though, I think not to take away from golf in the moment is that for fantasy, Josh, people are still going to be curious about Sam Laporta. Since even last week, we had that 50 yard touchdown. You know, I, I think it's just kind of over with our expectations. Like mm -hmm. a lot of these other tight ends, I think we can get there with the expectations that we have. Like Trey McBride, for example, they were drafted somewhat similarly. Obviously, Trey McBride a round or two later, depending on your platform. I think we can still get there among a top four tight end finish with Trey McBride. I just don't think we can get there now with Sam Laporta and how this offense is being utilized. I mean, again, when Jameer Gibbs, who didn't have catches in multiple games this year, goes four for 44 out of the backfield, when Khalif Raymond gets four targets, three receptions for 39 yards and a score, again, when Tim Patrick's playing a big role, that's going to leave out the likes of Sam Laporta and even the likes of Jamison Williams. You and I had more yards than Jamison Williams on the day, negative four yards on just one catch. So I'm a massive fan of Sam Laporta. I think he looks healthy. I think that he is still super talented. They just have so many levers and buttons that they can push that they don't need to utilize him in the same exact way that they did last year. Josh, I want to know what everybody is going to ask the question about. And it's Jameer Gibbs with more opportunity I'm just talking eye test, man. Yeah. And every time I'm looking at one of the four corners in my TV screen and I see number 26 touching the rock, making defenders miss in space, the acceleration just when he gets the ball in his hands, and I'm seeing 15 for 116 on the ground, just watching the game and watching Gibbs operate in space, operate out of the backfield, just your thoughts about moving forward with – I don't know how banged up Monty is or not. Of course. But it, does, does he have the type of stuff that you're talking about weekly top three kind of upside? Speaking of banged up, you mentioned it with Dave Montgomery. He left the game for at least a series after mm -hmm. kind of getting rolled up on with his knee. He needed to be helped to the sideline, uh, putting his weight on two trainers. And then, you know, Dave Montgomery's just an absolute unit. So he comes back in the game and obviously a bit later on gives up the fumble six, which really turn the tides of this contest. Um, but for Jameer Gibbs, you know this, Ray, from playing football, a lot of running backs will tell you that they actually liked running into stack boxes because if you make one person miss, then you're just boom off to the races. That is more Jameer Gibbs's game than it is someone like David Montgomery's, right? And you saw it when the safety was trying to fill and you get Tim Patrick blocking on the edge. Jameer Gibbs only really needed to make one guy miss or get seven yards of space from this awesome offensive line. And that's really the difference between, you know, Brian Flores facing other offenses across the league and then facing the Detroit Lions offense. When you have a group like this, even when Kevin Zeitler is missing, you can kind of command and, and dominate and be the hammer against your opponents. And they were definitely able to do that. I mean, Jameer Gibbs is the running back one on the week. That's ahead of Saquon Barkley. We're going to talk about that's ahead of Joe Mixon. That's ahead of two touchdowns, Javante Williams or three touchdowns, whatever it was on Thursday night football. Pretty amazing stuff here from Gibbs. The the touchdown run was so funny because he only had the safety to beat and he broke his ankles about 10 yards away, set yeah. him up to the inside and it just cut off to the sideline and took off. Uh, as, as for the Vikings, I mean, it really shows you that getting Aaron Jones back from a hip slash hamstring injury, they really had like no faith in Ty Chandler. They gave him even less work 
in this game. He actually had like a really nice blitz pickup that he started off with a perfect block and the play extended just for a little bit that it turned into a holding penalty for Ty Chandler. Uh, Justin Jefferson, again, I talked about the 25 yard touchdown. Um, there was also a 51 yard pass from Jordan Addison out of Sam Darnold's end zone. But again, like those couple moments that we've seen in other games, which led to wins for the Minnesota Vikings that Sam Darnold kind of reverted back to his former self. And, you know, you see those three or four snaps per game where he loses his head or makes a off target throw. Those were negatives in this contest, right? And one interception took four sacks on top of it. You could tell he didn't know exactly who to throw the, throw the football to every single time. So again, this is their first loss in the season. Certainly don't want to bury them, but, uh, those popped up and were far more noticeable in this game than they had been in other ones. That's for sure. I think it was encouraging though, that coming off the hip injury and again, with an off season of saying we need to make sure Andrew Jones is healthy. He out touches Ty Chandler 17 to two, not only that, but also looks really good doing it. Like yeah. I, his touchdown run while amazing. Cause he exploded the outside was a little bit on Brian branch. I believe that was Brian branch's assignment to seal the edge. And he cut to the middle instead. And Jones just takes it outside. It's like, bro, like, come on, you got to stick in your lo lane. But other than that looked great. I I'm so glad you brought up Brian branch's name. I would have been very pissed at myself if we got through this conversation and did not speak about mm -hmm. him. Uh, sure. You can bring up one negative. Potentially the oh, guy yeah. is playing with his hair on fire and he doesn't even have hair. It's back a buzz back weeks. and it's unbelievable. You know, like he is just insane. He had this one snap where he'd filled it perfectly uh, meeting. I think it was either Ty Chandler or Aaron Jones at the line of scrimmage. And then on the very next snap, he baits Sam Darnold into a throw fully extends mm -hmm. and comes up with it. And then later on, it was almost a fumble six that he took to the house, but I believe Jalen Naylor did have one foot out of bounds, just barely, just barely even after review. So Brian branch is one of the best defensive players in the league and for the Lions to have lost a Hutchinson for the season, they need that one guy to get them off the field in certain moments uh, on third downs on fourth downs or on turnovers. It's a very different position, but Brian Branch has mm -hmm. to be that guy for this Lions team and, in order for them to win the Super yeah. Bowl this year. And this game in particular, Ray, I don't know if you saw, like he was 20 yards away from the next closest defender at times. Like they basically put him back there and allowed him to just watch the play and then be wherever he needed to be, even making tackles at the line of scrimmage sometimes, despite having that much room to come up and cover. The one play I saw, Daigle, he was uh, flying in to uh, nail Sam Darnold as he was going to slide. Yeah. And I was just like, this dude's all over the place, man. Yeah. yeah. Insane. Okay. Let's keep it moving. Ray's first game. The Philadelphia Eagles, second straight week off a bye, get a victory. They improved a four on two on the year as they beat the New York Giants 28 to three. So just overarching stats here, Ray. Jalen Hurts, 10 of 14, 114 yards, one score. But really, this was all about the revenge game of Saquon Barkley playing his former team and going off 17 carries, 176 yards, one touchdown to add on with two receptions for 11 yards. Yeah, and this game was all about Saquon Barkley to start out. I believe there were six straight punts on both sides to start the game out. 0-0 um, zero, zero after the first quarter. It was dreadful. It was a brutal watch trying to watch the Philadelphia Eagles offense trying to operate as they tried to, as, as they seemingly forgot that they've got a guy number 26 in the backfield. Hmm. Uh, but once they figured out that Saquon was back there, things started to heat up. Let me, let me touch on some of the high level things that I think a lot of people want to know about. Um, from the New York Giants standpoint, Tyrone Tracy was up first. Tyrone Tracy was up first. I mean, he commanded the backfield work, what little work there was. Uh, Devin Singletary did not get a touch until the second quarter. I thought Tracy looked fine, but this this was just not a good game for the Giants up front. Everybody was worried about left tackle Andrew Thomas. It was the whole damn offensive line. I don't know who's playing right guard or right tackle, but that was very problematic for the New mm -hmm. York Giants as well. Daniel Jones had no time to throw the ball. Tyrone Tracy nor Devin Singletary, who I thought both of those running backs, to be fair, both of them looked fine running the ball. They looked fine running the ball, but there was not a lot of space. Daniel Jones' first two pass attempts, on, as you could have scripted it, right to Malik Neighbors right off the bat. Philadelphia shut it down. It was a safety over top, bracketed him the whole time. As you can see, 
There was there was no time or space to push the ball downfield. This was a one-sided affair. When Daniel Jones did throw the ball to the end zone for a touchdown to three to Theo Johnson, it was an offensive pass interference, got called back. I mean, the Giants just could not do anything up front. Seven sacks from Daniel Jones, couldn't run the ball, nobody to throw the ball to. And on the other side, it, it was very much a similar sort of feel as last week. Nothing, 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 throw the ball deep. And look, one-on-one -on -one coverage with A.J. Brown on the outside, touchdown. And once that happened, it opened up the running game. Saquon Barkley's incredible. I, I mean, had they not yanked the Philly starters going into the fourth quarter, he could have easily had a 250-yard day. Yes, Kenny Pickett and Kenneth Gainwell even had a, had a solid game. There was no need for anything. You look at this, 114 passing yards. Devontae Smith was a negative. He hurt yep. you playing him on the week. I mean, this is – it's – they got a great win in a division that is sort of in flux right now with some things that we'll talk about later through the show. Um, you walk away feeling great about A.J. Brown. You walk away feeling – great about Saquon Barkley and Hurts once he gets to the red zone they're going to tush push it but y'all I'm just telling you it's 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 one of those things where I I don't know how many weeks it's going to be all four of those guys eating from right. Philadelphia so quickly on Saquon he had 5.44 rushing yards over expected per attempt I'm not, I don't think that's a perfect metric or a, a, a perfect stat out there but that just highlights how incredible he was at creating yards on his own in this game. But Daigle, Ray hit on something there that I, I want to touch on. And I don't want to make it a massive deal. I just kind of want to put it into focus. And maybe it's the world we live in now. You know, coming out of the bye week, that's oftentimes when teams are able to reset and like really get into a rhythm of their offense, you know? Mm -hmm. And what we talked about on the show last week against the Browns is that it turned into ISO balls on the outside. And we didn't see like the Kellen Moore checklist that we wanted, you know, deep play action, work in the middle of the field, so on and so forth. Once again, this week, we didn't see what we wanted, deep play action, working over the middle of the field. I think it's just easy to say that what Kellen Moore now is doing is just leaning into what Jalen Hurts is comfortable with and what he does well. And it's what every offense thus far with the Philadelphia Eagles has been kind of forced to lean into. It's one-on-one -on -one shots on the outside and not working the middle of the field. And that's what you're going to have. So it's going to be kind of high variance nests other than AJ Brown for the most part. And that's disappointing more than anything for with me for Jalen Hurts because I don't know, and maybe I'll be wrong in week 17, but in week seven, I don't know if we're going to actually see him take that full field quarterback step that I was hoping he could this year. Maybe not, but in leaning into the strengths of your players, we did get a couple more tush-push touchdowns today because the idea of football is to score points on efficient plays, yes. and that remains That's one true. of the most efficient plays in all of football. So it's good to see that back. Not only that, but learning, like Lamar Jackson and Derrick Henry, although it seems like forever ago, it did take them two games to realize, oh, like we could actually just own the line of scrimmage with us two and just be a tag team, and that's it. You can do that with Hurts and Barkley this year, so that's okay. Not only that, but Ray, as you said, all four, will they eat weekly? No, but the one who knocks is A.J. Brown. We have three full yes. games with A.J. B. under Kellen Moore now, and it is a 34%, 38%, and today 35% target share. The dude is not going away as a top five, top six wide receiver rest of season. And let, let me touch on the big difference, I think, from Malik Neighbors in this matchup, because a lot of people are going to say, well, he's still got nine targets, difficult matchup versus Philadelphia. Y'all, I'm telling you, the issue is the offensive line. When you look at when Daniel Jones and Malik Neighbors were thriving, one sack, two sacks, another, they gave up seven sacks, and it was just pressure and uh, and i'm not making excuses for daniel jones saying that he's the best quarterback of all time but i will say like if you give him some time he can get the ball to malik neighbors that offensive line was a problem there was no mm -hmm. time to even hit malik neighbors on some downfield shots just keep that in mind as we move forward with some of these teams that might get after new york early that's what i want to ask you about not to put you under the spotlight here but we do have a chip and Malik Neighbors for managed leagues and fantasy. And so from Drew Locke with an injured offensive line, would you take this time to sell high or would you hold on to him? Because I think it's remember, a great question. Before this game, he literally led the entire league, not his position, the entire league in target share. 
Like if if that regresses, what does regression look like? Daigle, I'll be, I, I will just say this. Philadelphia had a very good game plan, and they said, we will not let Malik Neighbors beat us. Okay. You'll have to figure everything else out after that. And if Daniel Jones is going to miss extended period of time, and this offensive line plays anywhere like they did today, it will yeah. be a problem for Malik Neighbors managers, Daigle, no doubt yeah. about it. To me, that's an amazing question because I talked about the reset button on the Eagles end. The Andrew Thomas reset button is now what we're going to get for the rest of the year with this giant team. Now, you're not necessarily going to get, you know, Jalen Carter or Josh Sweat or Bryce Huff, who even had a sack in this game, you know, or oh, like I can Milton Williams, so on and so forth, all these guys, because the Eagles have invested so much in their defensive line. In fact, Nicobe Dean, their off ball linebacker, had two sacks in this contest. But there are like, when you drop below a certain level, we know with offensive linemen and you go to backups at that ex exact same point, it makes it easier for you to be attacked and for you to not pick up these stunts and twists and lose in isolation, so on and so forth. So I am concerned. Like if you would ask me what in week four, uh, when Malik neighbors had 23, then, you know, 27 and then 17 points. I would have thought that, oh man, this guy has a chance of being a top four, top five finisher the rest of the way. Um, maybe I am going too far with this and taking too big of a leap. I wouldn't be shocked if the offensive environment now makes it somewhat difficult for him to finish as like a top 10 wide receiver on the season. Like, would you, well, we don't know about Chris Godwin on Monday Night Football, but like, I think that would be an interesting debate of Malik Neighbor straight up for Chris Godwin the rest of the season. Gosh, and, and that's Chris such a. Right now, that's a great wide question. Receiver three. I, yeah, and I agree with you, but since we're talking about rest of season, like Godwin, what, low end wide receiver one, rest of season, fringe wide yeah. receiver one. So like we are, if we are comparing neighbors to that, we are backing him up quite a bit compared to where he is now. So that would mean yeah. you should probably sell him. It's just crazy yeah. that like these changes happened overnight and now we have to think about that. Uh, anything worth talking about here? Like, I'll be very interested to hear, you know, coach speak index and these press conference quotes this week, Ray on, uh, if Brian Dayball was kind of only resting Devin Singletary because he was coming off an injury, or if this is like a real flip with Tyron Tracy here, cause that's a, a major difference moving forward. If so, I'll just say Singletary looked good. I mean, he looked explosive, so it didn't seem, it didn't appear as though it was somebody they were trying to work back in. It felt like to me that Tracy had earned his opportunity to hit the field first, but they kept it was a ro it was a full fledged rotation like full series is for Tracy. He's off the field. Neither back could get in rhythm. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with that backfield. We will keep it moving and we'll stick in the NFC since there are so many good teams there and fun teams there. Daigle, next up for you, the Seahawks beat the Atlanta Falcons thirty four to fourteen on the road this is a west coast team playing at one o'clock and just dominating the yeah. dirty birds and it comes from geno smith who i believe had an intended air yards per attempt around 12 13 yards in this game just dropping nukes down the field over and over two touchdowns one of those went to dk metcalf and one of those the man himself the potential running back one the rest of the way Kenneth Walker. Let's third. go. <laughs> 19 of 24 for Geno Smith in the first half. And with 10 seconds remaining, rather than, or Seattle had to use their final timeout after an intentional grounding penalty, but rather than opting to uh, kick the field goal, they instead decided to run one more play, 10 seconds remaining, and then in turn took a 17 to seven lead into the locker room because Geno Smith hit DK Metcalf for a 31 yard touchdown and cover two. Uh, the route on the opposite side of the field goes a little bit earlier. The safety chooses that route. And then the middle of the field is wide open, just wide open over the middle for DK Metcalf, who recorded all 99 receiving yards and his receiving score all in the first half. One, because a couple of big misplays left out on the field, some big drops, including a drop touchdown, but also because unfortunately seemed to have suffered a serious injury in the fourth quarter, had to oh, get no. carted off from the tent. So we await word on Metcalf's status for the foreseeable future. Kenneth Walker adds to the box score in cutting up field and then, or actually cutting in, 
because he was left in a one-on-one out of the backfield and then fading by beating his guy over the top. And that's the catch, Josh, I'm sure you've seen a leaping 20 yard receiving score for a running back that supposedly could not catch the ball at all. And now here we are removed from Shane Waldron. Funny how that works out. And from that point forward, it's not just a big play for Kenneth Walker, his second touchdown of the day as well, but it's also important because the wheels came off. Atlanta had no chance after that. Their next three possessions include Boy Mafe just screaming behind Cousins for a strip sack that Derek Hall picked up and ran 30 yards to the end zone. And then after that, the next two possessions for the Falcons, two forced interceptions to end the drives that were also, I understand you're trailing, you have to make plays happen. Awful throws by Kirk Cousins, though, including the second one that was just well over his receiver's head. Michael Penix put in to close the game because that from, from that point forward, it was just over. What the hell happened? I mean, this was a Falcons team that we got our jokes off in week one. But mm-hmm. ever since then, they've been really solid, really fun. And especially in what these last two to three weeks where they've been utilizing Drake London in the slot. Great stuff from there. He finishes the day, eight targets, six receptions, 63 yards and a score. But did we just get non primetime Kirk? Like the, the Kirk of old where he goes on these streaks and these up and downs. And this was just one of the most miserable performances. And he's kind of lucky that no one watched it on week seven. That is a good summary. Yes. There's a lot of plays Kirk in particular left out on the field. Uh, There was though, oddly some rollouts he had at times like he was moving just fine but being asked to plant his foot and make late throws they were there were just a lot that were all over and scattered on that field so did not look good no Tariq Wool in this game who was funny not in this one was back at home because he's injured and he was watching the game not on NFL ticket because he makes over a million a year but on (laughs) methgames.com which is a pirated site to watch games (laughs) yeah of course and then he, he happened I wouldn't know. I just hear about it. (laughs) (laughs) He happened to screenshot it live, so that's a good time. But they did get back Byron Murphy. I think the thing is, though, is that you wouldn't know it from the box score, but they still had the Seahawks major issues up front. Because what had ha- what had been happening the last month, we thought because due to these injuries, they'd just been getting bulldozed and run over up in the trenches. But even today, Bijan Robinson, not just in terms of opportunity for fantasy, his first game to handle 80% of backfield touches since week one, but also looked awesome today. Yeah. Like when Raheem Morris talks about riding the hot hand, like Bijan was the hot hand today, and that's why he got so many more touches than Algier, who came in behind him with six. 21 carries, 103 yards, one score, three catches, 40 yards for Bijan. I mean, getting explosive runs of 26 yards and explosive pass of 26 yards. Ray, you and I are talking about that, the running back ranking show. We were just hoping for one of those explosive plays this week, and we got two of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we got that one where Bijan was, uh, I saw where he had dipped the shoulder, did the spin, just the, ex- it is, it's just explosive and violent and beautiful watching him run. What is not beautiful, Daigle, is trying to pick which Seattle Seahawks wide receiver to start on a week to week basis. Uh, Josh and I talked about this whole Lockett versus JSN thing, but if DK is down for an extended period of time and you look at the box score and I see three for nine for JSN, but I did see him get a deep end zone. It was almost a, a, a touchdown shot. It was a deep shot, a lot of air yards, just didn't connect with Geno. I, I am a little worried if DK is out. I don't believe there's anybody that's a one for one sort of DK role replacement. So what does this passing attack look like? Uh, I, I, I keep saying JSN has all these empty calorie targets and receptions. Who who is the guy if DK is gone that we can plug in and feel confident about? I don't know if there's necessarily a one for one replacement for all the reasons you think about when you think of what DK Metcalf brings to an offense. Uh, also, like for as much as I like Jake Bobo, just as a a man who should be on a fifty three man roster, mm-hmm. like Jake Bobo is not replacing DK Metcalf either, and he's the next one up in three wide receiver sets. I think it really what it's going to become is a lot more condensed to Kenneth Walker, Tyler Lockett, Jackson from the Jigba, and maybe Noah Fant as well, even though they continue to use three tight ends weekly. For JSN, it's just interesting because like even this game, there were some signals about 
his performance against zone coverage for his career thus far, I attribute that because of the type of routes he runs and just being closer to the line of scrimmage, which is why his yards per route run are lower against zone coverage. But maybe, like if you just want to try to paint a rosy picture, if DK Metcalf's out, maybe they have no choice but to change his route styles with Metcalf, like, not available. So maybe Jason's the one you want to buy low on, hoping he can outperform Lockett the rest of the way. Don't get me started on Jake Bobo. Uh, I will talk myself into a role <laughs> player who can win on contested catches down the field because they will need someone. They will yeah. definitely need someone to do that. Uh, just final point here, and shout out to Matty F. Brown, who does some great work on the Seattle Seahawks. He mentioned after the game that this was a style of Mike McDonald defense that would be successful against this kind of offense because Atlanta right now is 32nd in the league in play action percentage of their passes at 14.5 percent so to me if i understand even a little bit of mike mcdonald's defense one it can be tough to grasp because you do so many certain things pre-snap and post-snap and so i'm glad that it's finally hitting here and it'll end up being very good for seattle but two if you're not changing the picture or anything pre-snap to post-snap for an offense then the defense can kind of force the offense into those looks and take advantage of their mistakes so uh, that is something that's on my radar here with Atlanta in the future. And uh, Seattle certainly did extremely well on that side of the ball. And then before we move on, just need to hit on the a couple other Atlanta players because Drake London doing his thing as he usually does, even his touchdown, I believe he was lined up from the slot pre-snap, a couple other big catches from the slot. So we expected him to get there anyways. But uh, Kyle Pitts also, now the last three games, eight, five, and nine targets coming on stronger over Rayron McLeod, at least in this short stint. So just keeping the light on there. Right now, I'll just pull it up here. Uh, Kyle Pitts has climbed up to the tight end nine on the season shout out to you kyle pitts tied <laughs> with hunter henry on the season woohoo and one behind isaiah likely i'll bring up the kansas city chiefs being the san francisco 49ers 28 to 18 and just because you see 28 points for the kansas city chiefs don't get excited uh they are six and oh on the year this game just really wasn't fun and it included a whole bunch of injuries that we'll get to but the start kind of previewed how the rest of the game would be like we got a three and out for the 49ers and the chiefs also had a seven play 30 yard drive that ended in a fake punt that they failed on. Then Brock Purdy threw one, the first of his three interceptions in this game to Justin Reed off a of boot action. It was nowhere close, nowhere close to George Kittle and Justin Reed just cuts in front of him and picks it off. Um, and then Mahomes has a tempt interception at the line of scrimmage. He has right now more interceptions then touchdowns on the season still, even after this game, when they score 28 points, eight interceptions compared to six passing scores, we can bring that up to seven though. Cause he did have a sweet rushing score in this game. But again, we had injuries entering this contest. Juju Smith user was questionable with a hamstring. All the reporting that we got heading into it. Daigle, you know, this is I know, oh, Juju's dude. fine. He's going to play. It'll be Man. good. No, barely played. He ran about two or three routes. Then he immediately grabbed his hamstring, took the gloves off, helmet on the sideline, nowhere to be seen after that. Debo Samuel, we learn on somehow Sunday morning that he is dealing with an illness, but he bear, he plans to play and play through it. Uh, no, the first series, he's on the sideline. They explicitly say that he has a fan behind him to basically lower his temperature as much as possible. And then he's in and out, in and out, and does absolutely nothing in this game. And then worst of all, Brent Ayuk, who had a drop third down in a critical situation earlier in the contest, later on has a big uh, catch to get them inside the 10-yard line. But when coming down, it's a contact knee injury that just looks brutal. I mean, it buckles. Kyle Shanahan has said that they fear an ACL injury. And who knows? I mean, contact, ACL versus non-contact. I'm sure there's a pretty big difference between the two and uh, he gets carted off to the locker room after visiting the blue tent. And so we get Brock Purdy with like no one to pass the football to Jacob Cowing goes two for 50 yards. Ricky Pearsall gets his first three catches as a professional. Ronnie bell has an interception uh, thrown in his Dude. direction when either he yeah. runs the wrong route or something. So we go from this loaded San Francisco 49ers unit in previous years to now we will enter or finish week seven without Brent Ayuk, without Debo Samuel, and without Christian McCaffrey. And Purdy throwing three interceptions in this game, 
Uh, now Kyle Shanahan is 0-5 against the Kansas City Chiefs. And it's just bad news all around. And so with when Juju went down, this Chiefs offense really reverted to 12 personnel, a whole bunch of two tight end sets, which is not shocking. Then that also gives us Noah Gray as the team's leading receiver with four catches for 66 yards. And <laughs> you even get Kareem Hunt doing exactly what we thought he would of getting two scores but averaging just 3.5 yards on the ground mm -hmm. on 22 carries for 78 yards. So this is not going to give you the warm and fuzzies when watching the Kansas City Chiefs. There was one nice deep shot to Xavier Worthy, but Patrick Mahomes overthrew it. And then two plays later, he tries to once again target Xavier Worthy on a corner route. Xavier Worthy falls down, and that is intercepted. So there's no positives from this anywhere you look, yet these teams are 6-0 and and 3-4 and on the season. Ronnie Bell Ray, the one who also had the big drop on third down against the Rams, basically the reason why the 49ers lost to the Rams, that miraculous comeback game. They just can't get him on the field. I'm just looking at the box score, right? Yeah. Because the game was on my TV and I opted to watch my my Las Vegas Raiders and the good Rams. Choice. Oh, no, not a good choice. Never mind. <laughs> just guys, what? What the hell? Like, I, I honest, what the hell do you like? What, what are the actionable takeaways from this? Mahomes is still playing bad. Kareem Hunt stinks, but he's getting all the work. Yep. Right. W Worthy still so, the same coming out of the bye. I said, I want to see an expanded worthy role. Nope. What do we do? Yeah. And you know, they, they tried a couple things. They did like an end around and he had one short reception. But on the day, he had eight targets, three receptions, 19 yards, took a massive hit, a massive hit from Malik Mustafa, and then immediately went to the sideline and had to get checked out with his knee and was cringing and writhing on the... Uh, to answer your question, I think there's two ways of looking at this with the Kansas City Chiefs. Okay. The first one, they are 6-0, and defending Super Bowl champions. We've seen them be even maybe worse than this offensively, if not just to this level. And when they get to the playoffs, they put the power to the floor and they win it. And again, optimistically, you can say, oh, they can win games in multiple ways. You know, in this one, it was an efficient running game and just an amazing defense that totally shut down Jordan Mason for 14 carries and 58 yards. But then you can look on the other end and just say, we watch football for entertainment. We play fantasy football because it's fun. And this is neither an entertaining team nor a team that is putting up fancy points for us. And so it's just aggravating. It's frustrating to watch because you know that they are able to do more than this, but this is also a pathway to victory. I, I do want to be a little more positive about Xavier Worthy than it sounds like you two are, just because it, it was a season high 32% target share and a carry out of the team's buy. Uh, also, you know, the Mahomes missed moonshot down the field that Worthy was wide open for. So I know Judas Mishuster didn't play. He comes back so, so a little targets. But uh, I still want to be a little bit encouraged about it. The guy could but, not earn targets and then earn targets in one game. I want to be a little excited. Well, but I think part of the earning targets aspect was that they were trotting out Miko Hardman, Jody Fortson, and sure. Sky Moore, and Justin Watson around him, <laughs> right? That's, that's another so way to say to, it. To me, if Juju was in, then the targets may not have been earned other than that that deep shot. And then when they were earned, we had some mistakes and it's just a high variance player at this moment. Sure. And I'm a massive Xavier worthy fan. Yeah, uh, We just haven't still seen consistency. It's a long season. It's a long season for these rookie wide receivers. These guys can start to hit like we saw with Amon Ross St. Brown in his first year, right? On week 11 and on not comparing the two as players or where they're going to win. But even if Xavier worthy starts becoming a mainstay for this offense and a critical piece from week 11 on that can change you know, how his fantasy season has been viewed. But up to this point, again, it's just a mixed bag and super high variance and not fully involved on a snap and stand out basis. Well, Josh, you, well then talk about Kelsey then we, okay. Eight targets for worthy rookie. This, what the, what? Yeah. Four I mean, for 17, just, yeah, just on five targets. So, so what, what they were doing mainly with this 12 personnel is once again, Kelsey was taking the shorter stuff. And then they were doing these switch releases and then Noah Gray was able to take the deeper patterns. And so maybe there was some focus on Travis Kelsey because he's wearing 87. And then this guy wearing what number 83 is just wide open down in the second level. Look, tight end sucks. 
I think this team is really going to run a lot of stuff after 12 personnel. They were among the top three out of 13 personnel on top of it. And so it's not like a total shock to me if Noah Gray still remains a top one, two or three yardage getter in the passing game, like for multiple weeks this season as we move on. With his performance today, even with the rushing touchdown, this will be the 11th consecutive game that Mahomes has not been a top 12 quarterback. He will be in my drop list for one quarterback leagues, as sad as that yeah. is, this upcoming week because you can do better in streaming an option. If they were like seriously wanting to be more multiple and wanting to be more exciting, then they could try to make a move for someone like Deontay Johnson or someone else. You know, sure. there are, I'm sure contract wise, because they don't have that much money if, if I'm remembering things correctly. It's not going to take much the rest of the way for them to pay these guys. Um, but I don't know if they need to or if they want to or what their perspective is. You know, maybe they maybe they would just rather keep playing Carson Wentz inside the five yard line on goal line packages. They'll they'll figure yeah. it out as they showed us today. Of course, of course. And, you know, I can get frustrated like I was last year and then they'll win the freaking Super Bowl. Like, you know, what, what matters? Win. Yeah. Fun or trophies? Truly, what matters? OK, Ray. What matters is the Indianapolis Colts are four and three, I guess. <laughs> uh, now how they get there? <laughs> Not a lot of offense. Me and you will forever and always be Anthony Richardson apologists, but we can also sit here and say that in his return to the starting lineup after taking two weeks off 10 of 24, 129 yards, 14 carries 56 yards and a lost fumble. We wanted something different and we got more of the same. Yeah, this was uh, not an exciting game. 26 points in this game, and it was brutal. It was punt, 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 turnover, punt. It was rough. Um, Tyler Huntley ended up getting hurt in this matchup. Insert Tim Boyle. It really did not matter. This was the story of the ground attack. And more importantly, what people really want to know about was, did Anthony Richardson look as bad as the stat, stat line may suggest? So let me start by saying this. Dolphins saw the ball, just erase everything until Tua comes. I mean, it, Tyreek Hill had one shot before the third quarter, and he didn't see the ball. It probably would have caught it for about 50 yards. Didn't see it, just dropped down right in front of him. Waddle it does sound like next week Tua's coming back, though. Yeah, Tua's coming back. Mm -hmm. So just... Just kind of wipe this away. The big takeaway from the Dolphins is I do think that Jonu Smith as a playmaking option at tight end is viable. A at a position that has been that has been just wrecked this season, just if you need a streaming option at tight end, I'm going to be very curious to see how they continue to implement Jonu Smith, who looked really good in this game from the Miami side. They ran the ball well. I thought A-Chan and Mostert absent that fumble both ran the ball and looked fine running it. Again, from the receiving standpoint, just disregard it all. They, they were not involved in the offense. Nobody had any interest in throwing the ball down the field. For Miami, we moved to the Indianapolis Colts, and I was all in on Anthony Richardson, said I would even wear a Dairy Queen uniform if he oh, no. failed us this week in fantasy football. And I will say this, um, it did not start off well they dropped him back and tried to have him just throw. I mean, the first series of the game was throw, 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 back foot, throw, back foot, throw. As you watch the game and you listen to the announcers, once they started to do some design QB powers, we talked about Mahomes' missing of Xavier Worthy down the field. Anthony Richardson launched a disgusting about 47-yard pass on a dime, which Alec Pierce caught at the one-yard line. Pass interfered and everything, but the play was called back because of an illegal formation. That ripped off a big, big gain in the first quarter, which really, I mean, that play had everybody excited. Um, he hit Michael Pittman. Pierce dropped the wide open pass at the end of the half. Probably about a 30-something yard gain for Anthony Richardson. When they ran him and he rushed the ball, he got down, he slid, uh, slid took care of his body. Like, he played better in the second half. I don't care what the box score says. The second half of that game, and Miami did everything in their power to make life uncomfortable. I mean, Jalen Ramsey, Kate Orko, who they were blitzing safeties, sending corners. No respect for the pass catchers on the outside. Um, there was a play where Ramsey had him for a sack, and Anthony Richardson throws him off, gets the ball out. I'll say from a, from a progression standpoint, what we did not see him do did not throw the ball in harm's way. 
The fumble was a missed exchange with between he and Tyler Goodson down there. Uh, he took no sacks in this matchup. He got the ball out quickly, and when he took the when he took off the run, he got down and protected himself. I walked away from this one thinking, okay, the ground game of Tyler Goodson absolutely helped. You get Jonathan Taylor backed. I, I'm a little more bullish on what they can do. And let me just say this. When Shane Steichen took Jalen Hurts to that next level, and everybody keeps talking about what he did with Hurts, the one thing that he had that Anthony Richardson does not have in this offense is an easy throw. Dallas Goddard had the second best career of statistical career under Shane Steichen in 2022 with Jalen Hurts. They have no easy throws for A. Rich right now. It's downfield to Pittman, over the middle of the field, try to get it down the field to Alec Pierce. There's nothing easy for him well, right now. Nothing. I love Anthony Richardson, but devil's advocate. Josh Downs has basically been the easy button for every other quarterback that's been a part of this. And this is the massive fear that the entire fantasy community had that while well, Josh Downs has basically been Brian Thomas Jr. when it came to fantasy points with other QBs. And then he steps in here once again with Anthony Richardson and it's three targets, one catch for three yards. Um, and then like the but schedule that's Rich. over these, that's I know the, the, the schedule these next few weeks at the Texans, at the Vikings, against the Buffalo Bills. It's just like, we got to, completion percentage sometimes does not matter, but we at least need drives to sustain themselves, you know? Mm -hmm. And some easy buttons to be created here. I just get a bit nervous that, look, experience wise, Anthony Richardson's as junior in college right now, but it's just, He's still going to be a junior in college when he faces the Texans and the Vikings and the Bills defenses. And I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that it's not going to get better this season. Is, is well, where I I'm think those right are now. two different, I think that's two different conversations, right? I think does Anthony Richardson progress is one thing. Can you start Josh Downs, a player who wins right off the line, quick precision timing? No. When a rich is asked to throw the ball, he's waiting in the pocket and it's down the field. Every time look at his a dot, look at how far he pushes the ball down the field. Can you start him on a week-to-week -week basis? The answer is no. Can you start Josh Downs? The answer, answer is no. But when you watch this game and you're looking for positives to take away moving forward, I think the second half, there were those positives to his okay. game moving forward. Speaking of positives to take away, I also think what happened on the other side of the ball for the Dolphins' backfield was interesting because first game since week one, that we've had A-Chan and Mostert together for an entire game. And A-Chan, 17 carries to Mostert's 11. 100% of the team's running back targets and wearing a guardian cap. So maybe he stays healthy for a longer period of time now too. So uh, now that we're getting to a back, presumably next week, it has to be positive across the board for the Dolphins offense. They both look good, Daigle. A-Chan carried all the work early. I mean, and they were giving him everything he could handle. Mostert came in, which felt like in spell and relief of him. But these two should both be viable moving forward, especially with Tua back. I think I can question the Miami Dolphins' plan at quarterback with Tua, who mm -hmm. has missed extended periods of games in multiple seasons. And then your answer to him was Skylar Thompson. And then you moved to Snoop Huntley. And behind Snoop Huntley, it's Tim Boyle. We can separate that from saying, hey, at least for this game, the plan seems to be we're just going to run the football no matter what and barely throw the ball because yeah. 40 carries compared to 15 passes. And I know that gave them a positive game script at halftime. And then they obviously couldn't come back from it in the second half when Tim Boyle was in there. But I mean, again, reset buttons galore here uh, at the end of week seven. We could see just massive changes the rest of the way with Tua or we might not like let's not yeah. forget in the first what six quarters of the season two, this offense was not hitting as well as it was last year when they're building up these 10, 20 point leads. And so it's going to be fascinating to uh, be able to absorb this information of these next three to four weeks to get a feel for the real Miami Dolphins. And hopefully the quarterback stays healthy on top of that. Odell Beckham with a drop in this one. Too. Yeah. Just, I anybody, didn't even know Odell was if playing anybody this week, was to be wondering, he, he had a drop in the game as well. Legit had no clue that Odell Beckham was going to touch the field. He's going to even going to touch the field. All right, before we go any further, you know that we have two primetime Monday night football contests. So the best way to enjoy that is to play Pick'em over on Underdog. Look at all that. We can get Derrick Henry. I mean, 81 and a half rushing yards. That's all we need. 
at the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. We get to go down to like Lad McConkey. Hopefully he plays because if he does, I think he can dice up this Arizona Cardinals defense. He's been this close and the Chargers just haven't needed to throw the football at all. But even if he doesn't, I mean my guy, J.K. Dobbins. 99 and a half rushing plus receiving yards. Let's get it. Let's boogie. The best place and the best way to play pick them is on underdog and it's use promo code the show or click the link in the description down below because if you're first time signing up, we'll throw a new special in your direction and we'll match a good portion of your first deposit. Again, support us by supporting underdog because they allow us to make the show go play on underdog right now rest of the way uh these games stunk so we're going to go from the best of the worst all right i'll kick things off buffalo bells 34 tennessee titans 10 buffalo yes improves to five and two on the season and even though they scored 34 points this certainly did not get off to a great start i mean they were down 10 to 7 to the mason rudolph led tennessee titans they had one scoring drive in the first half three plays 61 yards outside of that they had 17 plays for 29 yards all other drives were three or four and out over and over and over again not exactly what you wanted to see from a new offense with a new wide receiver one in amari cooper in fact he came in for the second snap then on the third snap he dropped it on third and one right oh. off of his helmet oh. um but it got a lot better all right because he did finish the game with five targets, four receptions, 66 yards, and a score, including a red zone touchdown catch that was just over the middle of the field. You could argue that Keon Coleman even told Amari Cooper what route to run because he looked over him before the snap and then, boom, catches it. Uh, and then caught an awesome off-frame uh, pass over a crossing route of the middle of the field that was, again, off-target, and, uh, and it was a nice snag. So to me, Amari Cooper, the more playbook he learns, the even more he's going to play. And he definitely was the best separator of the group other than Khalil Shakir, who goes seven targets, seven receptions, 65 yards. Uh, of those 65 yards, 50 of them were on the same drive. He caught five passes for 50 yards on one single drive. Uh, they must have just seen something on the sideline of, oh, the Titans aren't covering you. Let's just go in your direction. Uh, and then some other fancy takeaways. I'm sure everyone wanted to know after Ray Davis's awesome spotlight yes. game last week of what the backfield share would be like to be honest there really wasn't a share i know on the box score it looks like james cook went for 12 carries for 32 yards and a touchdown uh and then ray davis five carries 41 yards and a score that 22 yard touchdown run was the last of the game when they were up 27 to 10 in the final no. moments and he just did what he does and run over the people and get into the end zone um, and then in fact, Ty Johnson even had a receiving touchdown ahead of him, uh, prior to that. So I don't think anything has changed on that front. Um, but we also got a season high in receiving yards for Don Kincaid. You think that's going to be high? Nope. 52 yards in this game. So on the opposite end, Mason Rudolph did his best Jake Browning. There was a point where he was like 22 of 26 for like 180 yards or maybe even less than that. But in the end, he just like can't get there. He's not mobile. He takes three sacks. He throws an interception. This offense still can't get anything going with Chigo Quanquo being their leading receiver with four receptions and 50 yards. And they are an abysmal one and five on the year. So my big question is that similar to how Devontae Adams, I assume, will cancel out Alan Lazard from that offense. I thought Amari Cooper arriving would cancel mm -hmm. out Keon Coleman, especially since Great to question. this point, Coleman has struggled with his profile in the NFL to earn targets, and yet today, a career high in receiving yards. Seven targets, four receptions, 125 yards for Keon Coleman, and it could have been even better. Uh, he had two big grabs that basically equaled about 90 of the yards, which makes mm -hmm. sense when he only has four catches for 125. But his first big catch was a busted coverage in zone. No one was covering him. And so he's able to then catch and run and that's about a 40 yarder and the 57 yarder everyone was pressed at the line of scrimmage it was i think cover zero on top of it and he was the only wide receiver on the field i believe and mm -hmm. so it was just an alert look from josh allen supposed to be a running play but he just trusts keon coleman to win on a slant he wins on the slant but then there's no one in front of him so he runs it again 57 yards and then right at about the 25 yard line he is hawked from behind uh 
by multiple defensive backs. So he couldn't pull away for the long score. And then there was also a near touchdown grab that he had that at first they ruled it a touchdown, but then he was bobbling it going from one hand to the other fell out of bounds while he was still not totally under control. So it went incomplete. So yes, it was a strong day from a box score standpoint, but Daigle, I'm not sure. And people might call me a hater. It's not a strong day from like how he has been used in the past of, okay. Hey, you're going to line up as an X outside guy, go win along the sideline, your 50, 50 balls. These were kind of, again, one-offs that went for big gains, but to me kind of, uh, not the sticky stuff that we're going to get on an every week basis from him. Well, talk to me about Calvin Ridley, because if you were to just tell me <laughs> that Mason Rudolph was going to throw the ball 40 times, that Calvin Ridley was going to get nine of those 40 targets, I would think like, okay, maybe he did a little something, something, but I didn't watch any of this. Like did the squeaky wheel get any grease at all, Josh? Yeah. I mean, on the first drive, they tried an early screen to him and it went absolutely nowhere. There was no blocking in front, you know? He had a 33 yard catch, but then like the nine target stuff was just off target or he dropped it. To be perfectly honest, there were plenty of times where it was within his frame and it was alligator arms or couldn't come down with a contested catch. And that's it. Like, it's just more of the same here. And there was even a period in the second half when they were just getting dominated the Titans where you saw Brian Callahan with his sheet laminated in front of his face, covering his microphone and saying next to him was, I believe a healthy DeAndre Hopkins, who was just like totally checked out and just had his hands behind his back and staying next to his head coach and just kind of like rocking back and forth. Just like, <laughs> I'm not going to go back in there when we're down 24 and we can't score points with Mason Rudolph. So I don't know where the Titans go from here. Like Tony Pollard again, looked good. 16 carries for 61 yards. Um, doesn't really get involved in the receiving game here despite six targets, but they were allowing pressure. They lost their starting right tackle. And then that petite Freer guy had to come back in. Who's been legitimately the worst tackle in the league. Mason Rudolph had three fumbles in this game because if it's wow. backside pressure or when he's getting sacked, he's just losing yeah. the football in those instances. So again, they did their best Jake Browning early on, and that could only last them two quarters and not four quarters. And this is just one of the worst teams in the league right now. They go see, this is where I have just, Fantasy advice in general, this is where I have a difficult time trying to provide analysis for people because folks will see, oh, well, he had nine targets, but it's like, not really. He, he, you know, he had nine opportunities, but like, how do you reconcile an offensive environment with, you know, you look at this and he was, they, tr they tried to get him the ball nine times more than they did DeAndre Hopkins. So just knowing when an, an environment is not conducive of success, but you see this, like, what do you just, how do you tell people to deal with this who are not going to watch anything? They just see nine targets for Ridley. This has got to be good. Especially when Rudolph is supposed to come in and be the game manager. Like he's supposed to do the one thing that Will Levis has not been able to do. And that yeah. stop turning the ball over three fumbles is wild. It just seems Correct. bad all around outside of Tony Pollard right now in Tennessee. And I don't know how Ridley's playable, even with bye weeks. I have no idea. All right, speaking of bad all around, let's go to the Washington Commanders demolishing the Carolina oh. Panthers 40 oh. to 7. I mean, there's nowhere to even begin with the Panthers, but the bad all around for the Commanders is we got one series for Jane Daniels. Mm. He goes two for two for six yards, but most importantly, has a 46 yard run on like the first or second snap of the game. And that's when it looks like he got injured, then had an awkward slide later on. Dago, they were looking at his like, left abdomen oblique rib area went to the blue medical tent then went to the locker room ruled out for the game who knows if that how significant it is and serious it is moving forward but uh it also speaks to the system that cliff kingsbury has that they were able to put again 40 points on the panthers which also included let me get the rushing oh yeah 214 rushing yards and 207 passing yards here including Jeremy McNichols averaging six yards per carry off the bench. Marcus Mariota, only five incompletions, 8.9 yards per attempt with touchdown passes to Ben Sinnott, who couldn't even get on the field prior to this. And yet Mariota comes in and just finds 
all the tight ends in this game. It doesn't sound like Jaden Daniels' injury is too serious, fortunately. His mom tweeted that he's fine. Afterwards, it even sounded like from the coaching staff that uh, Daniels could have come back in had it been a professional football game and not playing the Panthers. So seems to be okay. Like we're going to get that Jaden Caleb Williams matchup. We've all been waiting for next week. But as you said, Jaden Daniels played one drive and yet the commanders won 40 to seven. And now the Panthers have allowed the most points of any team in the Super Bowl era through their first six games. They are on an historic trajectory to be literally the worst defense in NFL history. You can't even stop Marcus Mariota when he comes in and it wasn't even stop him ray Push it back. was it was any pushback right any pushback that is the thing i understand that the panthers are decimated with injuries on really both sides of the ball but na namely like the three or four defensive players they had but this was five of ten on third downs the commanders didn't even have to get to third down again over 200 yards passing and rushing and it's you couldn't create pressure at all it's unacceptable there there shouldn't be 5,000 fans in the stands whenever the Panthers go back and play at home the next time. It's unreal. And, and and I feel bad because I'm looking at Chuba Hubbard try. I'm looking at Jatavian Sanders look like, man, that's that's a tight end I'd want my my team to have. And there's just, there's just the defense, there's no hope. <clears throat> How do we get here on Sunday night and there's 40 points and it just feels like, like it could have it could have been so much more. It could and even, have been so much more. Even Shuba Hubbard's touchdown was in the fourth quarter yeah, when exactly. it just didn't matter anymore. It, exactly. Even by then, there were business decisions being made out there in the fourth quarter. The the only quarterback who didn't get there against the Panthers has been Gardner Minshew. We know ever since he oh. has been. Oh, we saw him point. today. Yeah. Oh. You know, we, we definitely saw him today. Yeah. I mean, Deontay Johnson was asked afterwards, like, what's going on? He's like, I can't play all 11 positions out there. <laughs> the guy oh, no. One oh, catch for 17 boy. yards. Xavier League it had two catches for three yards. I mean, we didn't even mention that Andy Dalton on like his first or second pass attempt, uh, instead of uh, dirting it to Miles Sanders on a failed screen. He throws it to his opposite shoulder and that's returned for a pick six. And then he throws another interception later on, which he coined a miscommunication with him and Deontay Johnson on an inside breaking route. And then I don't know, Dago, if you had the sound up for this, but the commentators were mentioning that they just like really pressed Dave Canales on what their plan is going to be for Bryce Young the rest of the way. And it's like he was being very secretive about it and how he wouldn't put Bryce Young in in this game until the final five minutes when they were down again by 33 points and that they'll just see how it goes for the rest of the season and they have something in mind and so on and so forth. I mean, if Bryce Young can't play next week after we have seen the two real performances that we got from Andy Dalton against the Raiders and against the Bengals. And it's been a kind of abysmal ever since then, then they really don't believe Bryce Young has a future with this organization. Yeah. In my opinion, I still think though, that the direction is pointless under Andy Dalton, even though he's the better quarterback right now. Uh, so I believe we still see Bryce Young, even if it's like before or after the team's week 11 bye, And that's why I am trying to offload Deontay Johnson wherever I can, because if we go into the fantasy playoffs with Bryce Young at quarterback and Deontay Johnson, you just don't have a card to play. Right. But there there really isn't like a good time to do this is my thing. You know, it's kind of no, with right. the Drake May situation. I agree. You know, and we yeah. like next week, it's the Broncos. Are you going to do it in Denver? Against oh, the Broncos no. Defense? Absolutely not. And then you yeah. get the Saints and the Giants. And we know the Saints defense now is decimated and all that type yeah. of stuff. But then after that, the week 11 bye, that's when you're going to play them? No, because outside of that, it's the Kansas City Chiefs. <laughs> it's the Chiefs. And, says, and, then, and then you get Todd Bowles, and then you get the Philadelphia Eagles pass rushing unit. Like, there's not going to be a good time to do it. And it's just like, I, I don't know what the vision is with that quarterback department, other than they are just trying to maintain whatever value the rest of the league has in Bryce Young if he's not the starter of the team next week. And y'all, at some point, like, I can't wait until we have the shittiest matchup of all matchups to play you. You're going to have to go out there and play against NFL competition, good, bad, or indifferent. My only question to you from this game is, you see Austin Eckler's final stat line, four for 17. Is that more McNichols or is that just the game was out of hand? He's a veteran. There's no need to bang Austin Eckler up. Get him out of here. 
So there was some rumors swirling around that it wasn't just Brian Robinson who was banged up. Apparently, Austin Eckler has also been okay. banged up as well. I think they came in wanting to limit him as much as possible. And Robinson, they even had in the fourth quarter, still out there charging. And he Got looked it. great today off of his injury, despite being a true game time decision. So I think yeah. it was really just a game to get everyone healthy before next week's big matchup. Yep. Yeah, he looked great. And by the way, I know I have been a Bryce Young apologist in the past. I am not letting it slip that he looked awful in the first two weeks. That yeah. is not like the worst performances of his career. I am not saying, oh, he will look better yeah. in this. It's just, this is what you're getting from the veteran that you went to, to give everyone a chance, including your team from win and loss standpoint. That's not giving you that opportunity anymore. So why not play the guy when you have to decide if he has a future with this team? Because again, there's just no hope on any direction from it. Okay, we'll move on with a team that might not have a future either in the Las Vegas Raiders, unless their owner is Tom Brady, which it is. But bad teams stay bad because of ownership. The Los Angeles Rams improved to two and four with what turned out to be a nail-biting victory here, Ray. Uh, Kyrie Williams gets there for what, the ninth straight game with a touchdown. In fact, he scored two here. Uh, give us the details of this because there's not really too many flashy players in the box score here. No, this was one where, um, again, not a fun game, not a lot of points in this matchup. The end was uh, phonetic. The end was a little bit exciting, but to get to that point, it was quite disgusting. Aiden O'Connell started things off for us, and he was pretty solid to start. Six of 10, throws a ball, injures his finger, out for the game. This happens uh, close to the end of the first quarter. Aiden O'Connell is yanked from the matchup. It was very, I was very interested in the backfield splits for the Raiders. So Zamir White had been banged up, came into the season as the starter with Zamir White back, Alexander Madison, 69% of the snaps, 23 carries, 92 yards. He ran 20 routes, targeted three times, three for 31. I, I'm just going to say this. He looked a hell of a lot better than my outside top 24 RB ranking on this week's show. Um, led on, and I'm not here to pump Alexander Madison up hmm. as some long-term dynasty asset or as some great NFL talent, but in watching a team full of lifeless players, he's one of the few players on the Raiders that actually seems to give a damn, along with the stud and the star of the show, um, Brock Bowers. And I know I'm talking about a team that lost this one, but we're talking fantasy points. It is, it is truly a sight to be to behold how they are deploying Brock Bowers. I mean, they are lining him up inside, outside, first read target share as an aligned outside wide receiver on third down. He's the guy they are prioritizing getting the ball to. He looks like a he looks like a receiver out yep. there. I mean, he is the real damn deal. And, and it he's about all they got on the outside to throw the ball to. The player getting in the ball, Gardner Minshew, was dreadful. I mean, the Gardner Minshew experience, uh, it, 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 is beyond, it is beyond words that he can get away with some of the stuff that he does. Um, it, it's not good. But when in doubt, they throw the ball to Brock Bowers, and Brock Bowers and, Ale and Alexander Madison delivered for the Raiders, okay? Yeah. Quickly, on the Rams' side of the ball, we thought Cooper Cup may play. Cooper Cup did not play. That threw a wrench in a lot of plans. I said, hey, if Cooper Cup is in or out, I think you can play Tutu Atwell. He was serviceable. Six for 51, nine targets led the way for the Rams. But this is all about Kyron Williams. Matthew Stafford without Cooper Cup is just as bad as Gardner Minshew. It is not pretty. He can't move. He can't run. He has no, th th there are no legitimate options on the outside for him to get the ball to. There's no comfort. It is Kyron Williams, Kyron Williams, Kyron Williams. I walked away from this one thinking both of these running backs, if you got them, fire them the hell up. Brock Bowers, real deal. If Cup can't come back on a short week, which I think they play on Thursday, Tutu Atwell is probably the only one I've got any confidence in from the Rams. So immediately after the game, all beat writers said that Cooper Cup is going to play, that Sean McVay came out and said that. But it got to the point where I think even – Jordan Weddington was like dealing with a shoulder issue Daigle, yes. and that was kind of underreported and he was mm -hmm. kind of on the sideline for half the time. So they ran a whole bunch of 12 personnel with Davis Allen and 
Hunter Long and so on and so forth. And my only other note here is the reason that Minshew got in is because Aiden O'Connell uh, looks like he suffered a broken thumb when yep. colliding when the helmet of a either his offensive lineman or a pass rusher. And if it's a broken thumb, then that means we're going to get Gardner Minshew once again. And other than that game against the Ravens, he has been brutal, brutal this season. I, I also want to highlight, and it's not for fantasy, but for people who had may have had the Raiders plus seven, uh, and this was important, that despite being a tough-nosed, grinded-out coach who preaches doing everything to win, Antonio freaking Pierce, that team grinds out on their backup quarterback a 15-play, 66-yard drive with 2.49 remaining to make it fourth and goal from the nine-yard line. And they kick a field goal Always. down 12-20 to 20 to make it 15-20 to 20 rather than going for it. It's like, dude, yeah. you, you got to back up what you preach. Otherwise, it's just all for naught. We said that three or four times this season on the show. And I wouldn't say this to his face, but that's some fake tough stuff from Antonio Pierce when it comes fake to tough guy. How, how, how you talk about your press conferences and how your team you want to be. And then when you get into those moments, you don't do the tough stuff. You don't you don't uh, play aggressive. You don't believe in your guys. And that's uh, that's bad coaching. Yeah. It's not a joke when I say it looked like Madison and Bowers were the two out there, at least on the offensive side of the ball, that played with some heart that seemed to want to try to give everything that they had. And those were the two players who performed for us for fantasy. We'll now go to the Cincinnati Bengals being the Cleveland Browns 21 to 14. We can kind of go through the Bengals stuff real quick. I mean, none, none of us had full eyes on this game, but obviously T Higgins goes four for 82 and one Jamar Chase five for 55 and one somehow, some way this team needs to figure it out how they can pay both of these guys moving forward because their offense does not operate and function in the exact same way when they're on the field versus when they're off of it. Chase Brown in his first game as like the legitimate starter mm -hmm. uh, with Zach Moss being fully healthy, gets 17 touches for a total of 53 yards. Uh, but Dago, I think the big conversation here as the one in six Cleveland Browns uh, Deshaun Watson is, I believe, has a called um, designed run plants his foot. And from the rear view angle, you can see the vibration go from his Achilles up his leg, carted off towel on his head, almost certainly uh, a torn Achilles and out for the rest of this year. If not beyond, if not Daigle, uh, this might be the last snap we've ever seen of 29 year old Deshaun Watson on an NFL field. I believe so. And now without Amari Cooper, it's going to be an entirely, and with Nick Chubb back, we should say, it's going to be an entirely different offense, what we're looking at. Uh, hopefully for the better, since didn't Dorian Thompson Robinson also get injured at the end of this game? He did, but it was, it, it, it wasn't as big of a finger issue as a no Cano sound. They, they, okay. they don't believe it's, it's that significant, but the DTR factor in this is a notable one because in previous weeks, he had been listed as the third quarterback, the emergency quarterback. Mm -hmm. Heading into this week, in this game, we found out on Sunday morning that he was the backup and Jamison, and Jameis was the uh, the emergency quarterback. Now, I think on Sass versus Film or one of these shows, I'd mentioned that I, I've listened to an episode of Scoop City, and I it's, it's tough to know of which one because Deshaun's been brutal since week one. But Diana Rossini mentioned that she had heard that if Deshaun was going to be a benched or at any point, and they would actually turn to DTR and not Jameis Winston as the backup they wanted to see. Maybe mm -hmm. though, in this game, they saw enough of DTR because it was awful last year when he did yeah, get the start. Yeah. And then in this game, it was 11 of 24, 82 yards, two interceptions, three carries for 44 yards. And then things started actually kind of working when Jameson, when Jameis got there, uh, I don't know why I keep calling him Jameson, but when Jameis Winston got on the field and, uh, just like we talked about the Brock Bowers, the 14 targets, 10 receptions. We now live in like David and Joku Nirvana here, Ray, with 14 Love targets, it. 10 receptions, 76 yards and a score. And I think that this can be, I mean, let's not forget the rest of the way last year with David and Joku, he was a tight end one from halfway through the season to the end. If Jameis comes in here and does Joe Flacco like things with knowing Mark Cooper out there, this is like exactly the tight end usage we need in our lives. That's consistent stuff from David and Joku. Yeah, it's the only guy that you really, at this point, have confidence in starting. And Joku can go get it. Uh, 14 targets, 10 for 76, got in the zone. Hell yeah, you'll take that. You know, Jerry Judy got targeted as soon as Winston came in, and he dropped the damn ball again. Jerry Judy with another terrible drop. I mean, it's just, 
Y'all, this team is bad. This is a bad Cleveland team. Um, for me, moving forward, I, I, I like 12 targets for Cedric Tillman. I don't know. I just would hope I've got better options than to have to de- rely on Cedric Tillman. But then, but then the mind. question is like Cedric Tillman versus Calvin Ridley at this point. You know, like these are the conversations we'll be having. That's a uh, real in, question. In our fantasy too. rosters, you know. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be a whole bunch of think pieces and PFT articles on, well, what does this injury do to the contract with Deshaun Watson? I had seen some things of like, they've actually taken out insurance policies against him, the injuries. And like, this will give them some cap relief. I don't know how to read through these things. We'll find more answers here in the near future. Uh, just the guy has been brutal uh, in more ways than one on and off the field. And uh, you never want to see anyone injured. But again, if only his play on the field spoke for itself, then I don't see how another team off an Achilles would want to give him a chance. That's it. I think that's enough said. Uh, we'll go back to uh, Sunday morning. Why not? Because there's actually some things to talk about here from the Jacksonville Jaguars and the New England Patriots perspective. Uh, Dago, when you watch this game, Trevor Lawrence, 15 of 20, 193, one touchdown. Maybe most importantly, our guy, Tank Bigsby, 26 carries, 118 yards, two touchdowns. We've been on this since week one. That he looked better than Travis Etienne. ETN missed this game with an injury. Bigsby kind of started slow, but once, you know, they were not down 10 nothing in this game, they scored 22 points in the second quarter, and Tank Bigsby has a rocket ship up his ass and has a whole bunch of power and a whole bunch of speed. And I don't want to take anything from Tank Bigsby, but it's also a Patriots defense now under Mayo that's just falling apart in the trenches. Like you even go back a couple of weeks ago when Mostert and Jalen Wright totaled over 160 rushing yards. Last week, Joe Mixon got there, we remember, with two scores and 130 yards from scrimmage. So not shocking to see the best running back in Jacksonville's backfield just explode here. And that's kind of the issue. Like I know we should be talking about Tank Bigsby, but right now, like the Patriots have Drake May and they have nothing else to be excited about. I, I, and, I will add Hunter Henry on there. Like just okay. as we talked about Brock Bowers mm-hmm. and just as we talked about David and Joku, I legitimately think, and this was the process of the pick that Hunter Henry now is a viable fantasy tight end asset for us. I mean, he by far and away led this team in targets and receptions. Yep. Once again, we did not get clear injury news and reporting out of the Demario Douglas stuff because apparently he was sick. We didn't know how sick and he was in and out of the lineup the entire time. But again, Hunter Henry by far and away leads this team with 92 yards. Next up was in fact, Michael hasty Ray in a revenge game spot against the Jacksonville Jaguars. Yeah. Drake may is startable every single week. We had him ranked as a top 12 quarterback on the week. He is going to, no matter what the environment, no matter what the score, they're going to allow him to throw the ball. Uh, Hunter Henry is his easy button, and he went to Hunter Henry quite often in the second second half as they were trying to work their way back into this matchup. It's it's two weeks in a row that the New England Patriots have lost, but I walk away looking at Drake May in this matchup where the Jaguars did get back Tyson Campbell, one of the best defensive backs in the NFL in this matchup, and I'm saying there is something there. There is something there with Drake May, QB3 right now on the week in scoring just behind Josh Allen and Jalen Hurts. Wow. It's a, it's a big deal for me for the Jaguars to get Tyson Campbell back again. Their season is lost. Mm -hmm. They are two and five. And in fact, I don't know if you looked at their upcoming schedule. Good luck. It's the Packers, the Eagles, the Vikings, the Lions, and the Texans in their next five games. I don't know how many of those are going to win, but Ryan Nielsen has, you know, because this is what he does, play a bunch of band coverage at the first or second highest rate in the league. And he's been doing without his best corner in Tyson Campbell. So again, it does make, a difference when he's back. And I think the cons are overtly making it known despite the rumors and the rumblings of Doug Peterson because of how bad their record is that uh, he's our guy. They're taking pictures and posting and giving him votes of confidence. I don't know. Check back in when there might be a uh, three and nine or two and 10 after these next five weeks. Stakel. But at the same time, I'm a big fan of Trevor Lawrence. This was easily his most concise and efficient game of the season. And then the throws that he can still make no matter who they're against with Brian Thomas Jr., that 58-yarder when he was even and perfectly placed on the field. Um, Great stuff here from the rookie. Five receptions for 89 yards on the score. And this is the style of ball they probably want to play. 
that they have not been able to because their defense. But Trevor Lawrence, like you said, 15 to 20, being more of a game manager and making explosive plays whenever he needs to, like that's the Jaguars' easiest path to success. All right, we'll close out with Thursday Night Football, if you all remember it. Somehow the Denver Broncos are four and three on the season, and it's a long and distant memory after week two because the Northern Saints have lost five straight and are two and five on the year. The Broncos won 33 to 10. Um, I mean, Bo Nix, it's so interesting to look at this in a winning game and they score 33 points. And I felt like Bo Nix didn't even play well because uh, there were inaccuracies. He had two receivers wide open on like the first drive and he still has this tendency to move while he's throwing rather than reset in the pocket and drive his feet. But then you see moments of, of it happening and it's really nice and it's really good. And Daigle, on top of that, we know he's one of the best scramblers and sack avoiders in the league. And that's going to give him low key a rushing floor on a weekly basis that is Sam Howell esque for us when he's getting 10 carries for 75 yards here. Now averaging six and a half rushing points per week, which outside of prime time games, which we're still waiting on is sixth most among all quarterbacks. So that floor is certainly helpful. Not only that, but we also kind of knew what was coming up in this game. It wasn't just because of Rashid Shaheed and Chris Olave injuries, but the Saints defense had come into this one with over 150 defensive snaps played. Uh, we talked about this on last week's show, actually, that we kind of figured that Javante Williams and company were going to bulldoze them over just on a right. short week. And Although we thought we may also see an increase in Audric Estime's usage, maybe that was the plan. When you have two fumbles on nine carries so far this year, you're not part of the plan anymore, buddy. So a perfect run out actually for Javante. Yeah, this is, um, I think the big takeaway for me was, are we going to get a little more from rookie Troy Franklin? Uh, Cortland Sutton, did he play? Did he not play? Nothing from Cortland Sutton. There's not a lot to go around, but it did seem like there was a little chemistry there from Bo Nix and his rookie wideout. The New Orleans side, th th there's nothing. You can't predict. If you started said Wilson Jr., please comment below. Let us know because he was the only one that really did anything. Bub means nothing until late in that game. Spencer Rattler's not it. And I just want to say this, y'all. We sit here and right now, um, recording this Sunday night, Bo Nix is still QB 12 on the week. You're watching what he does, and we're looking around at QB play, Daigle and Josh around the NFL. And I just think that we probably, at the end of the year, we'll have this conversation. I think adjusting how we view this position in fantasy football moving forward is something that we're going to have to do. We're just in a different era with these kids coming up, these players in the NFL, these Bo Nixes. Like if Anthony Richardson had this game, we'd be like, man. 164 and 75 yards. And it's just bigger conversation than just today. Mm. But we're not in this era of Phillip Rivers and Drew Brees and Tom Brady and Peyton Manning. It's really different. And it's happening right before our eyes right now this season. I think my final point is on the running back position and namely Alvin Kamara. This has mm -hmm. been a show about reset buttons, I feel like. And uh, open the season, 19 points, 43 points, 14 points and 21 and then these last three weeks where we've seen the guards and centers and backup quarterbacks come in 9.6, then 15, and then 5.4. Um, obviously, the Broncos, fantastic defense. Uh, Buccaneers and Chiefs were the other ones. So, you know, we went from easier matchups to more difficult matchups. But I don't know. I, I, I certainly do not feel as confident, Daigle, that no matter what, Alvin Kamara is going to get there from a scam perspective because again, once you drop like below a certain level, you become like a non serviceable unit. And I'm a little bit nervous that we're going to get there with Alvin Kamara, uh, not being a top seven running back and instead maybe hovering around that dozen to 10 point mark too. I agree. That's why I think you should at least gauge in your league what you can get back for him right now because perhaps people do think that even when we get their offensive lineman back that maybe Kamara returns to that first month form and I'm just not so sure what the structure of this offense is the rest of the way those two games are great and I know they've suffered a lot of injuries but you can also zoom out and say they played the Panthers and Cowboys in those two first games as well so what does that even mean all right any further thoughts that you guys have about week seven or are we good Excited for Monday night. Excited for Monday go. night. Hey, I'm but, excited but, for the morning. Buddy, that's hot. 
What do that is hot? Yeah. Ravens yeah, Bucks is going to be night. hot as hell. Dago, we need it. We 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 need it, and let's just appreciate Lamar Jackson as we watch tomorrow night. I let's agree. Ravens Bucks is going to be so much fun. Yeah. Speaking of, I just found out twenty minutes ago that we had two Monday night football games. So, yes. if you just like me, I'm going to be playing because it's a perfect night to do it when we get two primetime games. Pick them over on underdog. Again, the best way to do that is use promo code the show, click link in the description, uh, and you can take, you know, Lamar Jackson higher one and a half passing touchdowns, or you can do Baker Mayfield higher one and a half passing oh. touchdowns. I mean, Chris Godwin has been going off for six and a half receptions if you want to take it there. Or we can even go down to the other contest, which will be the Arizona Cardinals and Los Angeles Chargers. Trey McBride, along with Marvin Harrison Jr. are in here, plus some James Conner stuff. And if Vlad McConkie plays, that's where my head is at, Daigle. What about you? Michael Wilson has actually doubled his yards per route run against zone coverage this year, and the Chargers play oh. the second most zone coverage in the league. So uh, add one of that to your fishy 10-leg <laughs> parlay. Oh, the, the only person who wants to bring up Michael Wilson on a night where we have a bunch of superstars is uh, is John Daigle. Once again, yeah. use promo code the show or just click the link at the top of the description. All right, that's going to do it. Daigle's going to have you covered in the waiver wire over on ETR. Ray is going to be joining me once again for a bunch of rankings shows this week. And we'll have Sam Sherman on our own waiver wire show as well. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you to Bruce Reeves up the villa. We'll talk to y'all soon. See ya.